Birds. Um, I don't know how many people here are botanists or plant ecologists, but if you have trouble finding research dollars or restoration dollars to work with plants, you should really go with birds. Because guess what birds need? Plants. Guess what plants need? Birds. So, and I'm going to explain what I mean by why you should focus your efforts on birds. Well, first of all, they're, they're good looking, aren't they? This is a Henslow sparrow. They're attractive. So save your prairies for the birds. Don't save your prairies for the botanists. <laughs> because look what they look like after they go in the field. And all botanists do is argue. Earl, that there is a sprawlish. There's not this more time. They can't even decide the genus anymore. So. This is an inside joke for botanists. The name has been changed from Spartana to Sparobolus. Supposed to be a little joke. And, and, and look at the botanists. They come out of the woods, out of the rubus and the smilax all bloody. They're hardcore. But do it for the birds. And more importantly, if you're looking for ways to protect and restore grasslands, uh, we have what's called the species of greatest conservation need. They're basically our priority birds. In Texas, we have 110 species on this list, and almost half need grass at some point in their life. Okay, more importantly, 26 of those are obligate grassland birds. That means they must have grass, just like we must have water, food, shelter. I mean, you can almost, you have to put grass in there as being essential. Uh, and 14 others are facultative, so somewhere in the year, they need grass, or part of their uh, environment needs to be grass, not as much as the obligates. Uh, Lanny Brennan already set the stage for this. This is another reason to protect prairies, is to look at the canary in the coal mine. Our grass and birds, we've been, the grass and bird people have been talking about this for half a century. This is not new to the bird people that grasslands are in trouble because the grassland birds are in trouble. And you can see this with the USGS BBS trend for Bob White um, for Texas. Uh, think about that as if that was your 401k over 40 years dropping almost 3%. So my last little message before I start the talk, if you're interested in the birds, if you're a plant ecologist, if you're a botanist, there are thousands of publications I could recommend, and I've not read them all, but I really like what John's Garden has done in these two books. It's the same author from Nebraska. He's done a really good book, uh, Prairie Birds and Grass and Grouse. They're easy reading. He's very good at synthesizing information uh, and boiling it down to something usable. So uh, I recommend starting off with these if you're interested in thinking more about birds because you're a plant biologist plant ecologist or botanist, you're wondering how can I get this stuff going? Again, I, I can't say this enough, use birds to get you, yourself in the door. So here's the title of my presentation, uh, Winter Grass and Bird Use and Use Restored Prairies in East Texas. Uh, none of my co-authors are here. They are a mix of fellow parks and wildlife and U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station biologists. Uh, here's our study area. We're essentially in the piney woods, but right on the fringes where you have a lot of black from prairie influence. And there are these little pockets, these little prairies that are embedded in the piney woods that are very much black from prairie. Um, and they host a lot of, of sparrows. You can see from the air what these prairies look like, their openings. You can see it on Google Earth. This Forest Service road cuts through one of these prairie openings and ends over here in a big one. This is one we use as our study area. And they're on heavy clay vertisols. They're not on the sandy, the loamy alpha sols and endosols right next door um, in where the pines are growing. Uh, they are uh, alkaline soils of the Ferris series and Houston Black series. And these soils were formed in a uh, long time ago. Uh, there are 25 prairies that we've, about 25 because we start off with about five and we've grown 
to roughly 25. We keep working on not losing some that we've restored. They're very small. It's not because we don't want them to be bigger. It's because the adaptive conditions won't allow it to be any bigger, okay? So these are naturally small little pockets. Our prairies average about five and a half acres in size. So they're very small and they're designed to be that way. They can't be any bigger. Um, and, and the metal arc is to remind me that because they're small, we don't get things like these through metal arc. We haven't found quail, we haven't found harriers, sprays, pippets, these birds that need big, expansive, expansive grasslands. We don't get those. We're getting species that are migratory. They're coming down here in the winter and they're looking for the right conditions, the right prairie conditions. Um, I learned something very, uh, this was new to me, working on these prairies. Again, this is a forested landscape. These are little pockets within. And so when you think of what, what kind of special equipment, you need data sheets, clipboard, pen, binoculars. Well, I learned real quick, we all learned real quick, you needed a chainsaw. <laughs> and because we had to go through Forest Service roads to get to these prairies, and with the drought in 2011, just wait a few years, a lot of trees fell over our road. We would spend sometimes two hours a day clearing out trees just to get to our prairie pockets, our research sites. When we get to our sites, remember they're, they're small, they're about five and a half acres in size. We, get, we have eight to 12 people. We do similar to what would be a search and rescue. We're standing, yay, distance apart, as you can see in the picture, and we're walking. We're looking for birds that don't sit up. This is winter time, so keep that in mind. There's not a lot of color in the ground cover because this is January, February, okay? And these are birds that didn't breed here. They bred far to the north, like that first picture was a Henlow Sparrow. That might have bred in Illinois or Wisconsin and came down here to spend the winter. And when they do come down to spend the winter, they don't sit up on fence posts, they don't sing, they are hidden. They're very hard to detect. So the search and rescue is the way to do it. When you're walking through, you'll flush it. And those of you that work in prairies, if you've got all your radar on and not just liatris radar, but if you notice things that move, you say, what the heck was that? I almost stepped on it. It was probably one of these sparrows that I'm going to talk about in the genus Amadramus, and like the Henslow sparrow that we looked at. They don't show themselves unless you almost step on them. And so that's why we're in the search and rescue mode here, is to create the disturbance that will make them fly so we can detect them. <coughs> and the three main species that we were looking for and found were, are all in the genus Amadramus. So they're, they're all obligate grassland species. They're all on the ground. And again, they don't sit up and they don't breathe there. So this is a winter only thing. So Hensel Sparrow, Leconte Sparrow, and Grasshopper Sparrow. Oh, so anybody gosh. that says sparrows all look the same, they're all bland and brown, they haven't really jumped in because they're very different, they're very colorful, and they, have, uh, they, they look different when they're flying away. We can identify them as they're fleeing because they're right there. Uh, you can almost grab them with a butterfly net, they're so close. So th this is a good example of, of this, the edaphic reasons, region, reasons for creating this. You can see it's completely lined with uh, pine trees and, and invaders that want to come in there. I'll, I'll mention those in a minute. Well, here. So the big invaders, th this is a prairie before it was restored. Um, the dominant invaders um, are yopons, eastern red cedar, um, locusts, and hawthorn. Those are the dominant ones that take over these uh, vertisols. But when you spend a little effort doing mulching, chainsawing, and of course following it up with fire, there, there's still a good seed source in most of those prairies that they would come back in good shape. Um, one of the 25 prairies, uh, what we call the study site, 
Some of my co-authors, namely Rusty Player and Dan Jones, they did a lot of prairie grass rescue in Huntsville nearby. They knew where a target was going in, and they said, hey, can we come in and scrape off all those plants and move them? And that, that's worked very well. Uh, it's very difficult to do. And, you know, don't ask me how deep you have to dig. I don't know. All I know is in another week, that was going to be a parking lot. So they did the best they could to just get those grasses and forbs out of there, move them on flatbed trailers, dump them off in one of these areas that used to be covered in, in those invaders I mentioned, and with a little effort, you can get them back into really good shape. So this is after fire, and this is the structure that these anadromous want, okay? So again, you're looking at this going, well, where are all the forbs? January, February. This is not when you would do a botanical survey for orchids, okay? <laughs> or gay feathers, right? So it looks bland and boring, but let me tell you, I, my co-authors and I, we can drive 70 miles an hour, see this out the windshield, and apply the brakes because the, the little blue stem, the structure's just right, it's golden. You know, early in the year, later in the year, the sun bleaches it, loses a lot of that gold flavor. But we can spot these at 70 miles an hour and know that they're structurally good for those anadromous sparrows. So let's look at one of these. So this is what it looked like before restoration. Uh, you would think, how, how is this ever a prairie? It looks like a thicket or a woodland. And that's what the invaders do after many years of fire suppression. This is what happens. So this was in compartment 60 on the Sam Houston. This was Prairie 21 in 2007, and this is just four years later. It was fantastic. Uh, great for these sparrows. Uh, let's do another one. Uh, year by year, this is a unique prairie because uh, a lot of stuff happened to it that I think is important. Uh, the only problem is we only have the one prairie, but I think you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about, those of you that appreciate disturbance and that and that that is part of the prairie's life so we're going to look at compartment two prairie number two for a four-year period starting in 08 this was one of our original prairies uh, one of the five that was there when we started but you can see why we call it rank it had there were red cedars look in the foreground here here's a hawthorn it still supported sparrows we uh, had nine in the genus um, nine individuals in this one prairie. So this is 2008. The next year they burned it. We had one anadromous hanging out. We found a little patch where grass hadn't, the fire hadn't burned and left a little grass, and that's fine. But the next year, 2010, uh, some loose cattle got out and really hammered it. Uh, we didn't find any sparrows because it was like a golf course where Tiger Woods should be putting and chipping his golf ball because that's not what these sparrows want. They want cover. Same thing with quail. They, they feel they have great stage fright. They don't want to be out in, in the open and exposed. They want to be hiding down uh, in the, the, the clump grass and, and running around in the little bare areas that are between the clump grasses. That's the life of those, those sparrows. So this is 2010 and in one year look what happened. It just was fantastic. Rainfall was just right, even though that was a drought year. It was 2010, you've got to think about the rain. We had 30 amadranus, we called this one pristine. So, I mean, we wow. wish we had more samples like this where we could say, okay, the fire was good, their vivery was really good. Um, you know, if you're, if you're uh, Alan Savory, he would really appreciate the holistic method here. You know, having a lot of cows do that shock grazing and get them out of there. So who knows if that all had effect, but this became a really good prairie for us in 2011, because look at the numbers of anadromous that shot up. So of our five original prairies that we have at least eight years of monitoring, so we're going out there every year. Uh, it's, uh, we're doing just simple monitoring in the, the search and rescue method I was talking about. And when we started with five prairies, we had just a handful of Amadramus. So the reason we lumped all the anadromous is in case anybody was saying, well, I don't know how you can tell a Henslow's from a Lacan's. <laughs> but I think most bird people that know grass and birds can definitely tell an amadramus. They 
Again, don't fly until you're almost stepping on them. They're very weak. They go right back down the grass. You just see this straw colored movement. But if you look carefully on the Henslows, they have a lot of reddish in the back on the wings. And you can see the olive face. And a lot of times what they do when you're driving in the, in the search and rescue, a lot of times the birds go out and then come parallel and fly parallel with you. And so you might flush it. The guy three doors down might say, oh, I can see the olive on the face. And so he might see that it's a Henslow sparrow or the buffy on the face, the big buffy eyebrow of a Lacan sparrow. So with a lot of experience, you can really tell these guys apart. But in case people are iffy about our species level determination, we just lumped it to genus. And that's really valid and important just to name, just to give the genus that was valuable enough. But you can see how what uh, on just these five curries, what the big change was we came, I came in in 2007, they told me about these curries and um, it's the National Forest and Grasses that are always seem to talk about the adjo adjoining trees, adjacent trees, but they weren't really focused on the curries. So I went in there and in just an hour I picked up all these Hensel sparrows in 07 and I said, we've got to do something. This is amazing. And so we started monitoring and we started really pushing them to quit putting a fire lane in the prairie to keep the forest that they were managing a fire. We wanted to sweep all the way through and include the prairie. So that was a big thing to do. It also included making sure that if there were any uh, of those invaders that they went in by hand and with a chainsaw to get rid of the, the, any lingering red cedars and so forth. So we attribute that to our, our numbers increasing um, we had 10 additional prairies that um, arose out of those original five and with us saying, hey, you can look at soil survey maps and say, there, there's another one here. Uh, they're often oval or kidney bean shaped. They're, they're uh, easy to spot on the soil map. So that's where we knew to do the, the future restoration of which we had. These 10 have gone uh, for seven years of monitoring. So you remember the picture of the, the, the thicket with all the different invaders, we would go to those and say, clearly, you can look around, kick around, the Henslows would never be in there, quail would never be in there. So we tested it, we looked, and you don't have to spend a lot of time. But quickly after those areas were mulched um, and burned, immediate response by these Amadranus sparrows, immediate. So what are the threats to these? Uh, grasslands, these little prairies in our area, of course, we all know that fire is synonymous with grass. The, the woody species, you can see them on the edges of these prairies. You can just see a, a, a line of, of red cedar just going, come on, man, quit burning. Come on, quit burning. I'm, I'm ready to step out there and do my thing. Um, so the edges are really thick with all these invaders that are ready to pioneer the site. This is a, bit, a bad boy that we have. Um, we are finding sparrows still using KR blue stem. It's not easy to know what they're doing in there. I mean, the, the KR is sometimes patchy, surrounded by the natives. Um, and I don't really have a good feel for what's going on with the KR. We have a sister project that's stemmed out of this that Rick Schaefer's working on, one of my co-authors. And he's looking at, at this specifically. Uh, of King Ranch. We're certainly not interested in promoting KR, but, but the sparrows appear to still use it in the wintertime. Of course, off-road vehicles are a problem. <laughs> uh, not on these natural forest sites, but any of these other sites that are nearby is a big threat to these prairies, like the Saline Barren. People with four wheelers go, look at this. They built this just for me. There are no trees in the way. There are no rocks. And it's just a perfect spot to tear it up with four-wheelers. Of course, feral hogs are a big, big problem. I took this out on one of our prairies. They just mess it up um, in a bad way. And then the, the livestock, the, the loose livestock, I don't know what to say about that. I, I believe in herbivory as important to these prairies. I don't believe in continuous grazing. And that's, that's where you lose a lot of your landowners because they're into continuous and that does not work for Amadramus uh, in, the, in this environment, okay? They need that structure to hide in. So, but after you burn it, 
and you get the cows off and you let it rest and you let it grow and a lot of people say, man, it's just a rank, nasty old field. That's where all those sparrows are. And I encourage you to walk in there and see what kicks up at your feet. And of course, fire is going to be a big part of it. So, uh, and with that, after a couple of growing seasons, hopefully you, uh, Henslow's will move in and the others, Leconte's grasshopper and there's Leconte's there. And that's all I've got. So if there's time, what are we doing on time, Lori? We've got time for a few questions. Yes. Uh, no, we're not doing any banding. We're, so we, we, the literature, as you know, Heather, is pretty strong on site fidelity in these anadromas. So it's assumed, but we're not, that's not one of our questions. We're, we're not doing research per se, we're just doing this simple monitoring. So we don't have those research kinds of questions or funding to, to cover it. Yeah. That's a good question. Leconte's probably two to one over Henslow's. Wow. And then Henslow's, then the next level is a big drop to Grasshopper. So we we don't we maybe find let we find less than ten grasshopper sparrows in all those prairies in a given winter, but we'll find probably three hundred Leconte's and maybe 150, 200 Henslow's. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yes. Um, I know you said like we had some cattle get like set up. You had some accidental grazing on um, one of your plots, but did you do any just like purposeful, just short-term grazing just to see if that would maybe benefit? The, these these sites are all on natural forest land, and so grazing is not allowed. And I think you know some of the natural forests, even in my lifetime, in the Kasachia, I would see uh, cattle being used in the longleaf, where where you've got vacuum sparrows and, and pitcher plant bogs. There would be cattle, but you know the cows have all been pulled off on these forests, and and so it was a neighbor whose fence went down and. The cows aren't done. They're like, hey, look at that over there. <laughs> fully stocked refrigerator. Can you guess how long the cow, it took for the cows to do that? We, we don't really know. Um, nobody was over there to, to monitor how long the cows were there. Really, all they did was showed up. We showed up their patties everywhere and yeah. stuff. So we, we know who's done it. Yes. For me? Yep. Oh, okay. She found about usually the problem if you're a landowner and you only own 50 acres you can't really do effective rotational grazing you can't do it and so I mentioned the savory method which is get a lot of cattle on there in a short amount of time and get them off and they're not back for several growing seasons something on that if you're you have 10 acres 20 acres you have neighbors around you that have cows and you're trying to manage your prairie you can go to that guy or that gal and say, hey, I'd like you to put your cows in here for five days, three days, 10 days, however long, I think that there's long enough. And when I ask you to get them out, she can get them out. And so, hey, he gets 50 extra acres of grazing, you get a management tool to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, and you create a relationship, and you do something good for the habitat as well. Uh, horses are a lot more destructive than that. Okay. As far as, yeah, the herbivory is different. But he's right. Thanks for interjecting on that. You know, you have to, obviously, if you only own 50 acres, you need to work with others to make it work. But, you know, herbivory back when used to be bison. They were nomadic. Um, some of the coastal curry bison, of course, were probably permanent residents. But um, it, it wasn't a daily thing like it is now. Yes? Um, so you had that search and rescue to flush out the, um, the birds. Uh, is that uh, done by volunteers or is it done by employees? These are all employees. Yeah, these are all um, Forest Service and Parks and Wildlife employees. And the other thing is um, to uh, restore the areas, and I, I missed the beginning of talks, and you might have said that, 
how did you know that that area was historical prairie? Is it from the soil or yep. just only from the soil? Yeah, I, I mentioned that, how you can find these on the topo maps because of the soil, um, or the soil maps rather. So they're, they're, yeah, and they're very interestingly shaped. I don't know, Jason, if you can help me look. Is there a reason why most are oval or kidney bean shaped? And they're not jaggedy. It's, it's, I don't know why they're that. Well, and then, okay, so, so these, these prairies sit on a geologic formation called the Plumbe Formation, which is a, uh, it's a, um, a marine deposition. So it's on a quest or a ridge. So you have sort of these envoys that, that went on. And so sometimes they'll either be like, you know, you know a cavern chain or sort of some sort of some kind of uplifting process. Because they're usually on ridges or side slopes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So quest there. So, so, so the prairies are on areas that have had enough erosion to get down to. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah to the clay. Yeah, you actually, yeah, exactly. So I think the reason it's not often is the circulars are eroding on a drainage layer. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jason's been to a lot of these sites. They're, they're kind of, um, I wouldn't call them headwater drains, but they're a natural erosional drainage. Essentially, you go way further down, down the terrain, you eventually get into you know, an intermittent stream segment. If you, if you look at the Fleming, I'm, I'm a geologist. Yeah. Yeah. If you look That's at that. the Fleming, <laughs> it's a limey clay and more of a limestone that has uh, closer to shore so it has a, a, a higher level of particles in it. Those areas that have the, the more resistant rock form, the little ridges, yeah. and, the, and the, the vegetation changes dra drastically depending on whether you're on the ridge or whether you're down in the clay. And that's one of the things that you kind of have to think about is why is it prairie? It's because it's on those sand, the sand, not exactly sandier, but areas that have better drainage. And so you get it out, you get the water out of there. And so there's not always enough water to support in the soil. There's always not, a, not enough water in the soil to support woody vegetation on a, on a continuous basis. You got to follow it up with fire because the woodies, like you said, they're standing there on the edge going, oh please, oh please. <laughs> uh, but that's basically what it is, and that's why those things exist in those little round spots, because those are resistant places that have resisted erosion and stuff has eroded around them and left this little cute little spot. Yeah. Huh. And because it's because it's alkaline, the the uh, the pines, they try to get out there too. Lava is a great pine here, and they do get out there and they grow for a little bit, but then they get very yellowy. Yeah. Uh, was that chloride? Yeah, I noticed the larger survive. sites, you know, like um, like a San Jacinto County, which is here on your walker tips on that size. Um, they're actually natural, the natural erosional drainage layers. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. and then the side slopes actually are all grasses. They're side of the tips of they're mixed, big grass system. I mean, natural. Yeah. Know, so it does just, well, I guess what happens soil wise doesn't balance that sort of natural erosional. Yeah, and, and, well, soil, and the thing about soils is that you can get a change in soil from, from a flat spot to going to a slope, you'll get a, diff, you'll get a different soil texture. And when you get the different soil texture, it, it affects the vegetation. And one plant thing, during the winter, okay, <laughs> there isn't a whole lot of stuff going on touristically during the winter, except there's two things that happen in the winter. One is, when you walk across this bridge, you'll see these little stalks with little, little Foreheads and that the foreheads you probably see by the thousands. There's a plant species called Missouri coneflower, Vecchi missourinensis. It's a real uh, strong tall grass prairie species in Midwest Kansas and North Oklahoma, Missouri, side, etc. So these prairies are the, the sort of southern refugia for Missouri coneflower. It's one of the, the co dominants with little wisdom and grass such ground systems. So I just wanted to note that, that when you walk there, you'll see these little, you know, the four whole foreheads by the thousands. The Missouri Coneflower, when you go in in April and May, uh, you experience this. It's yellow. just, just yellow Beautiful. sea of, yeah. 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 But not in January, February. Yeah. Andy? <laughs> One quick question. Do you see these same birds in uh, longleaf systems like uh, sandy lands where you have grass? Or do not, they need total open? Uh, so shifting over to longleaf, open longleaf with grass, uh, you lose leconts mm -hmm. and grasshopper. They don't like to be anywhere near shade, in my experience. But you'll pick, you'll still pick up henslows, and and you'll see a lot of studies done on henslows in in winter in the southeast, um, in the longleaf. 
Um, so yeah, I, I do think you could find Henslow's. The problem is, uh, like if you go to Angelino and the south end of Angelino, you got a lot of that oak and longleaf, and it's a needle and haystack. You're going to find those birds, and to get search and rescue in some of those compartments, you need 58, 80, 50, 60, 80 people to really <laughs> kick up enough ground. Because I've done it. I've gone out there by myself. And you're just walking, you're going, he's just, I probably walked right by him. He's probably, and then that one caught, I know, I didn't have enough search and rescue. So they could, they could to get back to your question, Andy, I think, yes, there's Henselos in, in those open closed open have, it's, it's, it's an open savanna. It's not closed canopy. So because you wouldn't be able to have grass if it's closed canopy, it's got to have sunlight. Uh, but what I was saying is you don't see lacons and grasshopper. In my experience in Texas, anywhere where there's a shadow from shade, in other words, if there's a tree nearby, they, they don't like to move into the savannas. And it depends on what you call savanna. You know, Reed Knox calls it savanna grassland. With a few trees, um, I, I would agree with that, that you don't have a constant grasshoppers going there. Jason, do you have another comment? Yeah, I, just for a conservation concern um, for um, another uh, facet that's I think, really important concern is those spot on prairies, is there's a uh, globally rare orchid, you mentioned orchids, um, it's called the Texas Lady Christmas Orchid, and the type of locality is Tyler County, about two counties east of where you for the study. And that species is, at least in Texas, uh, I did type it, because the first time it was collected was, you know, historically, you know, so decades ago. And so in these little countries, prairies, the big ones you study, and it's like, well, the large population of this orchid, it does put out its rosette leaves, and instead of, and the, the rosette leaves, unlike a lot of the other farming, you know, some of the versus orchids, we have linear leaves, actually has round, like orbicular leaves that are flat, like, you know, prostrate. So it's unlike any of the other spiranthes in North America. And, and you can go in and see these rosettes come up in, in February. And There's they flower, out there. And they flower in March. It's the, it's the first uh, spiranthes orchid that flowers in the southeastern U.S. And then, so these prairies are really important for that species for about six or seven populations in the prairies. And then the next place you see the species is in the Panhandle of Florida, a few populations, and one population in Georgia. So it's a fairly unique feature for that. Place. It's, it's pretty cool. I think we have got a, about three more minutes. Yes, sir. I noticed that 2014, the counts were way down on both yeah. the grass. Was there a reason for that? Yeah, I didn't mention that. We had a combination of uh, some drought before that, the growing season or two before that, and some management that took place late the fall, the previous growing season. So if you do, you know, I'm all for uh, growing season fire, but if you do it too late, and the grass can't respond, it doesn't get the structure. And remember, they don't like to be on stage. These birds have stage fright. So the stage was removed, was, was removed, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to do one comment, uh, put, in, put in a plug for the um, Houston Chapter Native Prairies Association. We had two trips out there led, with the Sierra Club led by, last year, led by um, Brant Mansion. And uh, so look out for it for next year. But we were going not in winter time, but in um, May and July. And the first time we saw a lot of bluebells, and the second time a lot of the um, oh echinacea. Um, what? Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you're not going in the winter because I want my birds. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet, so I can pick them up. <laughs> One last thing too, and this has to do with Larry the Lane's uh, presentation this morning. Uh, we talked about sort of small, you know, highly implicit communities that can be very diverse. Um, the uh, Warehouse Corporation owns a uh, set, of, set of these prairies in San Jacinto County. Mm -hmm. And Dan Jones is a, one of your fellow executive partners on your project. But then I've been inventorying these pocket prairies, just one area within the property. It's 80 acres of these little openings. And in those 80 acres, we reported 312 plant species. We've already vouched for any of so. so these are slight little tracks, but they have extreme diversity. diversity. And, and extremely important for high party birds. And so spread and mention is a yeah. continentally a high party species. Um, so, okay, thank you very much. It's lunchtime. Thank you.